Tonight, one man's agonising wait, a symptom of our sick system. And now the pressure's being ramped up on the government. Early learning, the Premier's $700 million pledge to fund kindy for three-year-olds. Pay rises for 2.6 million Australians, one in four workers getting a boost within weeks. The trolley trick these accused grocery thieves were hoping to keep under wraps, but now an SA supermarket boss is calling them out. And Matt Crouch out for the year as the Crows season goes from bad to worse. This is Adelaide's Nine News with Kate Collins and Brenton Ragless. Good evening. 91 elective surgeries were postponed today as health authorities battle an escalating crisis in our hospital system. Nine News has spoken to one SA pensioner who's been told he could face a long wait for an operation he feels he needs urgently. Selix Beach great-grandfather Bob Bishop worked hard for a comfortable retirement, but he's now spending his golden years confined to his home, suffering debilitating pain from a hernia. Very hard to walk. My wife's got to uh, wash me and dress me, so it's uh, pretty depressing when you normally do everything yourself, yeah? The 76-year-old considers surgery to remove his hernia urgent, but he says he's been told to expect a wait. I don't know whether it can take four years sitting around doing nothing. He's not the only South Australian with an agonising delay. Elective surgeries have been on hold at all hospitals since Thursday as health authorities try to ease pressure on the system. What we've got to do at the moment is make sure emergencies are attended to as quickly as possible. For lower priority patients like Bob, that means simply putting up with the pain. The only time I get any ease of the pain is on night time when I go to bed and go to sleep, yeah? Then you've got to get up the next morning and start all over again. The crisis has sparked fresh calls for free flu vaccines for all South Australians. There is demand for free flu vaccine and we would love to see South Australia to be proactive and join other states who have offered a free flu Program. Peter Malinaskis, with the click of his fingers, could deliver this. It doesn't cost that much money. Frontline doctors are also demanding solutions in this week's state budget. From a state government point of view, payroll tax is having a big a negative impact on general practice. We know that for sure. Now, Bob Bishop says he was initially told that his wait on surgery would be up to 48 months, but SA Health says it'll be more likely around 20 months. As for elective surgery, it was initially hoped that they would resume this Thursday and there has been no update today as to as if no update today on whether it will be extended beyond that or not. Shannon, thank you. South Australian children will soon begin their school journey from three years old under fast-tracked early education reforms. More than $700 million has been set aside in the state budget over the next five years to address key concerns from the Royal Commission into Early Childhood Education. While one-year-old Nate digs at daycare, That's it. his educators are doing something similar scratching at the surface of his future education needs. Forms a great basis for relationship building. Teachers already know and his educators already know what he needs. Early education reforms to supply this opportunity statewide, meet Royal Commission recommendations and target developmental vulnerabilities, with Thursday's budget outlining how three-year-olds will start their schooling careers from 2026. $715 million will be invested over five years, almost $340 million to fast track the rollout, $127 million to help the state's most vulnerable three- to four-year-old children, and more than $96 million to grow the workforce. You have to do it in the early years because 90% of a young person's brain development is done and dusted by the time they're five. Long daycare centres will be the first to take enrolments, followed by preschools phasing it in after 2026. The government wants to reach 3,000 three-year-olds in the first year. A significant hurdle to clear will be upskilling an already thin workforce to accommodate for the teacher-led play-based learning. About 880 additional early childhood workers, around 800 additional early childhood teachers and about 120 other staff. The opposition says this almost doubles the current early childhood teaching workforce. Unless you can actually have qualified staff in the room, it doesn't deliver on what it was promised. We have the ambition and a plan to be a national leader when it comes to early childhood education. Will DeFulvio, Nine News. 
Millions of Australian workers will receive a pay rise from July. The extra cash coinciding with tax cuts for every wage earner. The Fair Work Commission also indicating it's now working on a plan to boost the pay packets of sectors dominated by women. Shop assistants, cleaners, hospitality, healthcare and community workers all to receive a pay packet boost. To increase the national minimum wage and all modern award minimum wage rates by 3.75%. The minimum hourly rate, currently $23.23, .23, to increase to $24.10 from July 1st, taking the minimum weekly wage to just under $916, up $33, an above inflation decision that'll see 2.6 million Australians on 121 different awards better off. Any day working people go forward in terms of a real pay increase is a good day. It will do little to take further inflationary pressure out of the economy and that was our objective. The Fair Work Commission indicating workers in highly feminised sectors like early childhood education, home care and disability workers, psychologists and the community sector will receive even higher pay rises next year. We would have liked to see the Commission make an interim pay increase. Well, I mean, how much longer are women expected to wait? Although every worker will receive a tax cut from July 1, in the nick of time for many. The financial regulator finding almost half of Australians with debt have struggled to make repayments in the past 12 months, citing cost of living pressures, reduced income and unexpected expenses. We want people to earn more and to keep more of what they earn. Right. And on July 1, both of those things will happen. But what the Fair Work Commission and tax cuts deliver, the Reserve Bank can take away with higher interest rates, although Treasury still believes inflation will fall through the year. Andrew Proben, Nine News. A pair of suspected shoplifters have been caught on camera using an unusual method to allegedly slip away with thousands of dollars in groceries. Drake Supermarkets taking to social media to call out the tactic, claiming multiple northern suburbs stores have been hit in the past month. Gifts are usually forgiving, but not this oversized surprise. I thought they were bringing me a present, but it looks like, oh, this is a trolley swap. A woman is seen entering a drag store in Salisbury North with what appears to be a giant present. A man pushing a cart of groceries stops next to her. The gift box placed on top of his items. The pair then swap trolleys before leaving the store, allegedly without paying. It's very creative. Haven't seen such creativity. If they put that creativity to something else, I'm sure they'd be very successful. No one will notice a big present in a trolley with a bunch of balloons covering my face. Drake Supermarkets now calling out the pair who have been captured on their cameras at multiple stores across Adelaide's northern suburbs in the past four weeks. This person and this team has been very busy. Gawler, Gawler East, Clovercrest, Salisbury. Police are now investigating the incidents, with Drake's claiming the pair have cost the business around $1,500. There's plenty of charitable organisations out there. If you need food on your table, there are plenty out there that can help and unfortunately we're not one of those. But people aren't just stealing items to put on their dinner table. The main products targeted are high value ones like premium meats, deli cheeses and beauty products. We know they've been sold on marketplace. It's not just like, oh, we're trying to feed our family. The family business claims there's been a 38% spike in theft in the past 12 months, accounting for around $10 million in losses. Samantha Hogan, Nine News. Dashcam footage has emerged of a frightening crash on Portrush Road at Marden. A truck driver failing to pay any attention to the car in the next lane, changing lanes, hitting it and sending the Toyota spinning. Fortunately, the people inside weren't hurt, but the car did need to be towed. Police say the truck driver was fined for failing to properly give way. A man has faced court for the first time accused of causing a horror crash which killed an innocent driver at Golden Grove. 32-year-old Kirsten Rawoli died when her car was hit by a four-wheel drive in February. 62-year-old Hillbank man Mark Burgess appeared in the Elizabeth Magistrates Court this morning. Is there anything you'd like to say to the family? Burgess is due back in court in September. 
Police have recovered a huge haul of allegedly stolen goods, including a trailer load of bikes, in a raid on a home at Glandor. It was prompted by the discovery of two 3D printed guns during a traffic stop at Kings Park. The subsequent search also found a shed full of allegedly stolen power tools. A man and woman have been charged. A major reprieve for a South Australian father facing drug charges in Bali. Prosecutors have agreed to drop an allegation he was trafficking meth, a move which takes a life sentence off the table. Tucked away in a Bali back street, the rehabilitation centre, which is now home to South Australian Troy Smith, away from the crowded jail cells and prying eyes. Troy needs to uh, focus on himself. That's why we're not putting him through all this media. Um, carnage. The 49-year-old father today in a major legal win. Prosecutors agreeing to treat him as a likely drug addict rather than a drug trafficker, downgrading the charges against him. The, the Article 114 has been dropped. Yeah? Article 114 would have carried a possible life sentence for the 3.14 grams of methamphetamine found in both Smith's hotel room and mailed to him from Cairns just over a month ago. His high-profile fixer, a former police officer credited with managing Chappelle Corby's case, says psychological and psychiatric reports have now shown Smith to be an addict, dealt with more kindly under Indonesian law. The manager of the rehab facility says Smith is still in withdrawal. He's physically a uh, little bit going well, uh, but we still uh, continue with the program. But Smith is said now to be clean, grateful and ashamed of what he's done. Everyone in life sits down at some stage to a banquet of consequences. This is his entree. As for the main meal, that is still for a court to decide, a hearing to determine whether Smith has to serve any jail time or whether he can stay in rehab will be held as soon as next week. Will McDonald, Nine News. A former Saka and Sanford Juniors umpire has been jailed for more than two decades for repetitively preying on vulnerable teen girls online. Beth Excel was in court. Beth, it was a parent who raised the alarm. Yes, Kate, from the other side of the world. And the judge said if that hadn't happened, the 42-year-old from Edwardstown likely would have continued his vile ways. Father of two, Brett Alford, was sentenced to 23 years behind bars. He admitted to soliciting child abuse material from the young girls who he'd been grooming for a year before he was caught. In total, he was communicating with 10 victims aged between 11 and 16 years old, all of them overseas, most in the UK. The court heard Alford would use Snapchat and Instagram, manipulating the teens into sending him explicit pictures and videos by paying for them with Amazon gift cards, clothing vouchers and money to buy Uber Eats. None of Alford's victims were linked to his work as an umpire. He's already in custody and must serve as at least 17 years. Thank you, Beth. Police are investigating a suspicious fire at Lightsview. Residents reporting a car alight in Gill Road just after 3.30 this morning. The Holden was destroyed, but the fire didn't spread. And a stolen car has been found dumped at Finden, driven into the car park of a Grange Road business around midnight and left there. A man was arrested nearby, but police are not yet sure if he was the driver. Well, thousands of fans are right now streaming into Sydney's Accor Stadium in their green and gold to see the Matildas take on China. Nine's Vicky Jardim's there. Vicky, excitement is building there. Well, it certainly is. This is a sellout crowd. In just over an hour, the Matildas will go head to head with China in their second friendly match. It really is the last time for players to show off their skills ahead of selection for the Paris Olympics. The team will be announced tomorrow. Sam Kerr is, of course, not playing due to injury, but in a touching moment, she was spotted on a video call with Mary Fowler. I'm sure she was wishing the team well. The green and gold is streaming in 80,000 fans and just in the last 20 minutes or so the team was spotted arriving at the stadium on the team bus and I really wonder who is going to win tonight. <laughs> No question. Thanks so much, Vicky. Well, Rennie joins us with more in sport coming up a little later on. Crow season just goes from bad to worse, Rennie. Br Brendan, we knew they had a few injury concerns, but unfortunately, Matt Crouch is, is a little worse than yeah. first thought. Let's go live to Braden Ingram at West Lakes. Braden, you broke the news this afternoon that it's season over for the veteran. 
Already the Crows have issues on a number of fronts and now they've lost one of their premier midfielders for the remainder of 2024. He suffered the AC joint in the first quarter of that loss to Hawthorne. Pretty remarkable he played out the game and had 35 touches given the fact he will undergo surgery later in the week and will take no further part in the Crows campaign. Matt Crouch good enough to stop for Nine News as he left the club today. Not a great result, but uh, yeah, get the surgery and then we'll see what happens after that. Is it just a bit of a shock given you thought it might, it might be a chance for Thursday night? Uh, no, it wasn't really a shock. I knew it was pretty sore, so um, yeah, it is what it is, so just going to move forward now. Along with Crouch, Taylor Walker unlikely to play on Thursday night against the Tigers. Jordan Dawson, the skipper, also in doubt. I'll have more on that in sport. Rennie? Looking forward to it. Thanks for that, Braden. Now, injuries aren't the only concern at Westlakes. A number of players are out of form, including youngster Josh Rochelle. He tells Nine News why he's finding the going a little tough. And speaking of form, Big Charlie's lost his way, but why he's still a key cog to the Powers flag tilt. That's all coming up. Thanks, Tommy. We'll see you soon. Doubts over downsizing. Yeah, it's a problem rippling through Australia's housing market. Still to come on Adelaide's Nine News, empty nesters are staying put causing a severe lack of stock. We lay the problem bare next. Also coming up a little later, the new way of fighting a common cancer. How it could be used to treat other forms of the disease. And how a grass seed led to a medical emergency for one of our police poachers. The body of a 30-year-old woman has been found following an explosion at a unit block in Sydney. Trainee nurse Jasmine May was at her mother's home in the city's west when the blast occurred. Rescue crews sifting through rubble to locate her. An investigation into the cause is underway. Leaking gas was a known issue at the apartment building. The majority of empty nesters are not considering downsizing, according to new research. Concerns about the economy are preventing older Australians from moving, and that is causing problems to ripple through the housing market and economy. Finance editor Chris Kohler explains. Having too many bedrooms? That is not a problem for empty nesters. Four out of five Australians over the age of 65 are not interested in downsizing to a smaller home. And fair enough, it's their call. But it means young families aren't moving into those bigger homes and it also means retirees aren't getting a windfall of cash they can spend. And experts say it's down to bad policy settings. Basically any money you have tied up in the family home is exempt from the age pension eligibility rules. However, as soon as you release that equity and put it into another vehicle like superannuation or even the bank, you start to get penalised in terms of how much age pension you're eligible for. So the push is to change those settings to make downsizing easier because the research also shows older Australians want to help their kids in this tough economy. 20% say they'd accommodate their family, and many are. 15% say they would pay their bills. More than 1 in 10 would cut back on their spending, including holidays, but just 7% would sell their home and use some of the money to help their family. So it's well down the list because the financial hit is too big. And this research out today is designed to trigger some changes from state and federal decision makers. One of South Australia's beloved police dogs is being celebrated for making a triumphant return to the beat. PD Jack's back fighting crime after an, ex an extraordinary fight for life. Uniform fastened and back on the beat. Police dog Jack's back where he belongs with handler Andrew. A very different picture from just a few months ago. To see one of your best mates like that, um, it does sort of, it pulls, it pulls at your heartstring and it makes you concerned. Andrew noticed Jax was having difficulty breathing. Within hours, he was rushed into emergency surgery. Jax, tough in the face of hardened criminals, but it's believed to be a grass seed which brought him down. An ultrasound was put on his chest that quickly identified a large amount of fluid in his chest cavity and that led to some other tests which... Uh, gave us the diagnosis of pyothorax. A serious bacterial infection which could have been fatal. He had oxygen tubes coming out, uh, he had to walk around with an oxygen tank, he was all bloated up. Not only has Jax made a full recovery, but Andrew says he's performing better than ever and already has a number of new arrests to his name. I think he's got a new lease of life and um, yeah, I think he missed that time that he had down has reinvigorated him to uh, come back and, and be a better police dog. It's rewarding um, to see 
particularly working dogs, when they go back to, to work um, catching baddies. And the man who knows him best says Jax is happy to be back too. I know the kind of dog he is. I know he's, he's a fighter. So I knew that he was going to pull through. Inga Nielsen, Nine News. Well, we've shivered through our coldest day in months as temperatures plummet. Dizzy Braithwaite, it's right on cue for the change in seasons. Oh, look, Brenton, it feels like just like that. The seasons have snapped and today feeling it particularly chilly, that's for sure. I think it came as quite a shock because you consider it was only last week that we were up in the mid-20s, but not so today. Our coldest day since last September coming in at around 13 degrees and right now it's only 12 degrees in the city. Now with the change of the seasons the SES has also put out a warning they're reminding us to make sure our homes are ready for those inevitable winter blasts. They say majority of South Australians are concerned about the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather yet more than one third do not feel prepared to respond. So an early warning there thankfully in the short term our forecast is looking quite calm with even a little bit of an increase in those temperatures, so I'll have the details soon. Thank you, Jessica. See you then. In the news ahead, helping some of the sickest of South Australians. A new health hub providing cancer care. How it will stop regional patients needing to travel great distances for treatment. The details next. Also ahead, the zero-cost approach to doctor's visits. And it's not bulk build. And big trouble at the monster trucks. Fans sent scrambling from live power lines. It could be happening in any home. Nothing gets done, nothing gets talked about until they're in a body bag. Nine News Adelaide shines a light on violence against women. The stories of victims turning pain into change. The survivors desperate for more help and how we all have the power to help end this crisis. Watch the full series on Nine Now. Cancer patients north of Adelaide who faced long journeys to the city for chemotherapy will now have a much closer option. A new treatment centre is opening at Elizabeth Vale tomorrow with thousands of South Australians to benefit every year. Five months ago, Samantha Barsh's life was turned upside down. So I'm currently receiving chemotherapy treatment for triple negative breast cancer. Diagnosed in January, the Tanunda mother of two has been doing the two-hour round trip to the city for weekly treatment. It's become a lot, as you could imagine, especially when you're coming down for, for weekly sessions. Um, some people that I have met along the way have had to come down multiple times in a week as well. But that's all about to change with the new $4.75 million Calvary Connery Centre opening at Elizabeth Vale tomorrow, allowing patients north of Adelaide to be treated much closer to home. The facility has 18 oncology day chairs and three treatment rooms, specifically designed to deliver chemotherapy. The demand for oncology and haematology services is growing due to the population growth out north, and particularly where we're sited here at Connery Centre, um, we'll see that demand grow even more. So being able to to have an easier access point um, is going to be fantastic for not just myself and others in the Barossa, but also wider, um, further out. From that. This facility will significantly reduce the burden on cancer centres in Adelaide with thousands of patients to be treated here. This is the only um, facility of its kind between Calvary North Adelaide and the Barossa so we're really excited. It's part of the $165 million Playford Health Hub which when completed will include radiology and ClinPath facilities. Dylan Smith, Nine News. Far-right Israeli ministers are threatening to dismantle Benjamin Netanyahu's government if he accepts a peace plan made public by the US president. Late today, an Israeli foreign policy advisor has claimed the framework deal needs a lot of work, but they will agree to it. The conflict in Gaza exposing a battle within Israel. <laughs> Members of the ultra-Orthodox community forcibly removed by police as they protest moves to have their exemption from military service removed. But Benjamin Netanyahu has a bigger fight on his hands on another front within his government. It's over the three-stage peace plan made public by US President Joe Biden that would see a ceasefire, the withdrawal of Israeli forces in Gaza and the return of all hostages or their bodies. <laughs> One of Israel's far-right ministers, Itamar Ben-Gavir, says if Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to lead this deal, we will dismantle the government. 
but families of hostages went to the Prime Minister's home to make their feelings known. I'm here to support my government in taking this deal. Pressure too from the White House saying if Hamas agrees to the deal, it expects Israel to also abide by it given it was involved in its crafting. Prime Minister Netanyahu's team, in fact, his foreign minister, again, just said uh, that they welcomed this, uh, th- this announcement by the president and that they did, in fact, agree that this was their proposal. Meantime, Israel's defence minister says he's preparing an alternative government to Hamas to rule Gaza. But holding his own government together may be a more immediate issue for Benjamin Netanyahu. In London, Brett McLeod, Nine News. A wildfire near the US city of San Francisco has burned through 5,600 hectares of land. It's the state of California's largest fire so far this season. The blaze shutting down major highways and forcing residents to flee their homes. Former US President Donald Trump has given his first sit-down interview since his criminal conviction. He says Americans will not stand for him being sent to jail and it could push them to breaking point. But his opponents say he's only inciting violence. America's first convicted president returns home to Mar-a-Lago. Donald Trump seemingly unfazed by what may lie ahead. The judge could decide to say, hey, house arrest or even jail. It could. Face it could. What that could I'm OK with it. A prison term for his hush money conviction appears unlikely, but he's issuing a warning if he does get one. I think it would be tough for the public to take. You know, at a certain point, there's a breaking point. This is clearly Donald Trump once again uh, inciting violence. New polling shows the conviction has barely moved the needle in the minds of voters. 49% want him to end his campaign. That's hardly changed since the indictment last April. 40% say he's fit to be president. 51% say he's not. 89% of Republicans say he didn't get a fair trial, while well over two-thirds rate loyalty to the former president as very important. With Republicans and Democrats frantically fundraising ahead of the presidential election, Donald Trump's son Eric has claimed their side has reeled in more than 300 million Australian dollars since the conviction. A conviction the former president says is taking a toll on his family. How's Melania doing with that? Uh, she's fine, but I think it's very hard for her. I mean, she's fine, but it's, you know, she has to read all this crap. Facing three other trials and a run for the presidency, Donald Trump is fighting on. My revenge will be success. Americans will decide if he gets the White House. In the United States, Jonathan Kersley, Nine News. Several spectators at a showground in the US state of Maine were injured after a monster truck brought down power poles while performing a jump. Two people were taken to hospital while the driver of the truck escaped injury. Well, it's not bulk billing. Instead, an insurance plan that covers the total cost of your visit to the GP. When Nine News returns, how private providers are trying to woo customers with value-added coverage. And the life-saving melanoma treatment, and it's being used in other forms of cancer care. It's being heralded as a revolution in cancer treatment, a new approach to help patients beat melanoma. Australian of the Year Professor Georgina Long is behind the trial with the same method now also showing promising results in patients with other cancers. When Matthew Croxford was told he had stage 3 melanoma, he feared the worst as his cancer had spread. Am I going to die? Does, you know, I've got a wife and, and two children. Before then, he didn't think much of the marble-sized lump on his collarbone until he got tested. Professor Long and her team said to me that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, this would have been a a terminal diagnosis. Australian of the Year Professor Georgina Long co-led an international trial to shake up standard protocols by giving immunotherapy before surgery. Of the 423 patients taking part, One group received usual treatment. That's surgery first, then a single immunotherapy drug. That order was flipped for the other group. Two immunotherapy drugs first to shrink the tumour, 
then surgery. With nearly only 10 months of follow-up, we saw a 68% reduction in the risk of recurrence or death from those who got the immunotherapy first. Introducing immunotherapy earlier gave them more firepower. We can train the immune system against the cancer, melanoma, better. Nearly 60% had an excellent response without many cancer cells left. Matthew was part of that group. The only side effect was a little bit of fatigue from time to time. The next step is to seek regulatory approval to make this standard practice. There is also hope among experts that this novel approach could be applied to other types of cancer. There's probably more cancers than we know that could possibly respond to this. Two years on, Matthew remains cancer free. And I'm lucky because of the hard work they put in. Gabriella Rogers, Nine News. Free GP visits and nurses on call are the new offerings of some of Australia's biggest private health insurers as they attempt to provide customers more value for their premiums. But consumer advocates say wealth shouldn't determine access to care and the services are creating a two-tiered system. When Ruth Bolster feared she was having a stroke on a Saturday morning, a Medibank magnet on her fridge became the first port of call. I called the 24-hour nurse line and got a really lovely lady. She said, I think you need to go straight to hospital and you should not drive. Ruth followed the advice and was diagnosed with a detachment in her eye. Now she's a big advocate of the phone service she tapped into, which Medibank has made accessible to every customer. It can be on the nurse line anywhere from coughs and colds, stomach uh, or chest pain or medications review. Covering entry level care is an increasing interest for the big insurers. At Booper, three free virtual GP visits are being offered per year to around a million customers with extras cover. We do worry and like to look for areas where we can provide value by providing these uh, a set number of sessions with zero out of pocket. We're also supporting our members at a cost of living at a time where cost of living is high. But the Booper program is only a pilot and needed special approval from the Federal Health Department. That's because under current Australian law, private insurers can't cover out-of-hospital medical services like GP visits and some diagnostic testing. So consumer advocates say more moves like this run the risk of creating a two-tiered system. I think Australians all want everyone to get a fair go with their health care and don't want these divides to deepen and continue to grow. Stephanie Anderson, Nine News. Well, Reddy's back with sport now. Reddy, season over for a veteran crow. Yeah, unfortunately, horrible news for Matt Crouch. He requires shoulder surgery. Not good, Raggy. And up next, we'll return live to Braden Ingram at West Lakes. He's got all the details on what's fast becoming an injury crisis. Also, an out-of-form Josh Rochelle bracing for some tough love. A buy at Alberton and it's come at the right time for Charlie Dixon and why Monas told the critics to stay in their lane. Hello again. The Crows' Thursday night clash with Richmond is shaping as a crossroads moment in Matthew Nick's tenure and injuries to a trio of stars is only making things harder. Returning live to Braden Ingram at Westlakes, Braden, Matthew Crouch is the big casualty. Yeah, just another big name on a list that's getting far too long for the Crows. Look, he played out the game and there was some optimism that he might be OK. Instead, though, that AC joint damage to his shoulder is simply too big, meaning the only option is surgery for Matt Crouch. His season is done and he's certainly disappointed. This was Matt Crouch as he left the club today. Not a great result, but, uh, yeah, get the surgery and then we'll see what happens after that. It's just a bit of a shock given you thought it might, it might be a chance for Thursday night. Uh, no, it wasn't really a shock. I knew it was pretty sore, so um, yeah, it is what it is, so just got to move forward now. The personnel likely to be further limited come Thursday night. Taylor Walker looks all but certain to miss with that back injury, while Jordan Dawson, that hampered 
foot injury or the injury that hampered him on the weekend. He was a no-show at the light flush run today. They'll train indoors tomorrow while they've got their captain's run on Wednesday, so he'll need to prove his fitness then. So then it comes to the possibilities who could come in and whether they do start to look to youth. Nick Murray, Billy Dowling, Dan Curtin, all impressed in the sandful on the weekend, leaving Matthew Nix with some very big questions. They simply must win against the Tigers' side, decimated by injury, but there could be some players facing the axe. There's many out of form among them. Josh Rochelle. Rugging up from the winter chill at West Lakes, Josh Rochelle is well aware come selection, he could be left out in the cold. There's so many guys who've had that in their career, so something you just got to do and, and play at the level and play at an AFL intensity, especially if we're a bit, a bit low on form. So. I think that goes through every player's mind, especially when we're not playing well, we're not winning games. He's bracing for some honest and robust feedback in the wake of his goalless 11-possession game against the Hawks. We didn't get a lot of inside 50s on the weekend and I didn't play a lot of midfield again. Um, See so a plane mainly up the ground. He'll seek clarity as to why he was only thrust into the midfield for two centre bounces as opposed to 14 in the thumping of West Coast. And it's something that I don't, I probably don't really know what's going on too, so it's something I'll um, sit with the coaches and ask questions today about even how can I help inject myself in the game when um, I'm not getting too much of the ball. He's also revealed he's been managing a sore ankle in recent weeks, but even with Adelaide's mounting injury toll, there's no excuses. We can't really blame that. We've got so, we know there's so many teams with injuries at the moment and um, we just we had a few that probably weren't at their 100% on game day. Finals might be realistically out of the picture, but there's no cue in the rack just yet. I think it's still only 10 points out of the eight, so it's still very even from third to tenth, um, so we're definitely not going to rule that out. But another fail on Thursday night against the decimated Tigers wouldn't just spell an end to those faint hopes, but raise serious questions about Matthew Nix's future. Corey Norris, Nine News. Well, injured Port Adelaide forward Sam Powell Pepper has defended the out-of-form Charlie Dixon, declaring the veteran still has a big role to play in the Powers Premiership push. The Power will use the bye to hit the reset button ahead of a challenging second half of the season. Sam Powell Pepper has spent much of the last six weeks with his feet up at home and his teammates are following suit. For a few days at least. I think the buys come at the right time. And Thursday night's loss to Carlton had some labelling the power a fake top four side. And while Pal Pepper dismisses that tag, he concedes they are unpredictable. Some aspects, yes, but um, in other in other ways, I think we've proven that we're the, a good side, and a few things we're not really. Um, proud of. The form of Charlie Dixon is the elephant in the room. The veteran forward goalless in his past three matches and was subbed out against the Blues in the third term after just one touch. Charlie, we, we rely quite a bit on his presence and his leadership and you know the goals come but we we value like things that aren't goals. So. But things won't get any easier for Ken Hinckley's men. Their next four games, Premiership fancies GWS in Sydney, Grand Finalists Brisbane, St Kilda at Marvel and a re-energised Bulldogs. Yeah, we've got some quality sides we're coming up against after the break and I think it'll be a good challenge to see where we're at. And um, yeah, obviously some of those teams are flying at the moment and not going to be easy. But they'll have some welcome relief. Skipper Connor Rosie returning from a hamstring niggle. So too Willie Rioli from a calf strain. Emma Henderson, Nine News. Well, the Powers AFLW side has returned to the club for the official start of pre-season training. They've secured eight new recruits since last season and they're hoping they'll all have an immediate impact. I think we did need a bit of a change. Um, they're going to bring heaps of talent to our group this year and they're highly capable of coming straight in and really helping us win those games. Port Adelaide will open its campaign with a showdown against Adelaide at Alberton on August 31. Well, a fiery Steve Monaghetti has defended Australia's Olympic selection process after a controversial omission from the marathon team. Despite running a slower time, Jess Denson was picked over Lisa Waitman, but Monas says it's time to move on. As a mum of two, Jess Stenson has her hands full. One more photo. And she's had even more on her plate recently as debate raged about her place on Australia's Olympic team. The last few weeks have been challenging and it's really nice to be here today knowing exactly what we're preparing for. Stenson was one of six Australian women to post an Olympic qualifying time. 
But here's the catch. There's only three spots on the team. Lisa Waitman actually ran a quicker time than Stenson, only to miss out on selection. We're very supportive of the process and it's it's just it's difficult. You know, we've got we've got six women qualified, which we've never had before. The whole saga prompted an awkward online spat. Waitman's husband demanding Stenson remove this photo from her socials. And at today's team unveiling, Monas didn't want a bar of it. We are just celebrating the athletes that we have here who are going to the Olympic Games in Paris to realise a dream. An upset. Understandably shattered, her Olympic dream crueled. Waitman had threatened to take the matter to the Court of Arbitration for Sport but she's now backtracked. That hopefully clears the way for a much smoother run into Paris. Is it time um, for everyone to move on? It is, yeah, look, training for a marathon takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus. The team also includes Genevieve Gregson. She's making the switch from track to marathon after snapping her Achilles in the steeplechase in Tokyo. People think I'm crazy to say it, but the marathon has been the easiest event I've ever done. Clint Stanaway, Nine News. Let's go to tennis. Alex Dimonor takes aim at Daniil Medvedev tonight with a spot in the Roland Garros quarterfinals on the line. Australian Open champion Yannick Sinner again looks the man to beat. He accounted for his French opponent in four sets, moving him closer to the world number one ranking. And it's clear he's becoming a crowd favourite. It's always a, a big pleasure to play on this special court. Um, night session, it's, it's always an honour. So thanks everyone. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the atmosphere, as I said, has been amazing. Although Greek star Stefanos Tsitsipas, who booked a quarter-final clash with Carlos Alcaraz, also looks impressive on Gem tonight. That match straight after the news. Alex Dimonor, Daniil Medvedev, yep. blockbuster. Should be a good one. Thanks so much, Tommy. Well, to Money Matters now, and June trading kicked off with a positive day, but it could be a rocky month for investors. Finance editor Chris Kohler explains. First day of a new month on the market, so not a bad time to check our progress for the year. So far, the ASX is up 170 points, pretty slow and steady. Massive gains from Illumina, and A2 Milk is up 67% this year. A strong set of earnings numbers back in February sparking a big run for that share price. But Strike Energy and Domino's Pizza are among the worst performers so far this year. Now, May is usually a flat month, and we did a bit better than the average this year. And over the last decade, June has averaged negative returns, so investors might have a rocky few weeks ahead. No worries today, though. The index up 56 points with the bank strong, while retailer Levisa took a tumble. The Aussie dollar was down slightly, but we have some big items on the agenda this week. GDP data on Wednesday and interest rate decisions in Europe and Canada. All will have an impact on our currency. Thank you, Chris. Well, we certainly felt the cold morning this morning, didn't we? Sure did. And it seems these chilly nights are here to stay too. That's right. Jessica has the forecast next. First, though, here's tomorrow's speed campers. Wake up and laugh with Adelaide's number one breakfast show. Rudits and Laws tomorrow on 104.7 Triple M. For the latest Adelaide news and traffic. Hello again. Well, just like that, we have been plunged into some very icy temperatures today, our coldest day in months. I think it feels even colder, more of a shock because we had such a warm week last week. We were up in the mid-20s, so certainly nowhere near the mid-20s today. 13 degrees was our top, and it's around 12 degrees in the city right now. Of course, we had the cold mornings as well. It was around 5 degrees in the city and even colder in the suburbs this morning. And then, of course, Mount Lofty, even during the day, it was so cold up there. We only managed 8 degrees for a maximum there while on the plains many suburbs came in around the 14 degree mark. Up north we had some outback rain at Ernabella today more than five millimeters there there could have been a bit more in other spots but there aren't many rain gauges up that way so it's hard to tell. A further south it was the icy mornings dipping to minus three at Renmark and Murray Bridge and also Padthaway before maxing out around that 11, 12, 13 degree mark. On the charts, there is a front actually just sneaking across South Australia, but it kind of fizzles out before it gets to Adelaide, offering only the slight chance of a shower. Around the country tomorrow, it's looking pretty chilly in Canberra too, with 13 in store, and Melbourne with 14. Brizzy just creeping up into the 20s. 
Back to South Australia. Now that front that I mentioned could bring some rain to Woomera, Roxby Downs, Cooper Pedy and even places a bit further south. A shower or two possible at Clare with 13 for a top. There's not much rain on offer through the southeast though and most areas more so just looking at a cloudy day with the slight chance of a shower. 17 degrees for Kingscote and Victor Harbour. We do have another frost warning in place for the lower southeast and at the other end of the state it's a marine wind warning for the west coast. Meantime on local waters we're looking at northerlies to around 10 knots. So tomorrow around Adelaide, temperatures just taking a baby step up. 15 degrees for Elizabeth and Golden Grove, 16 degrees in the city. Looking overcast, the slight chance of a little spit or a spot tomorrow. And after that, thankfully warming up just a little bit. We've got a few days of 17 degrees and then a couple of 19 degree days to thaw out. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks so much, Jessica. And that's Adelaide's Nine News for this Monday. Glad you could join us. We'll have updates a little later. And our late news is at 11 tonight. Have a great evening. Good night.